Hi, this is Jeff Eaton. So in this video, I'm going to show you how I set up a Windows computer as my primary machine learning workstation. Now, I use Windows, Mac, Linux a lot. Mac tends to be difficult for deep learning because they just do not have native support of GPUs. I mean, they don't have NVIDIA, so that doesn't, that doesn't help me much. And the latest versions of TensorFlow do not support GPU directly on, on Macs. So it's going to be primarily Windows or Linux, and a lot of Linux. I do have this machine set up dual boot for Linux, and I'll be showing you some stuff on Linux as well. For this video, I'm focusing on how do you set up a Windows workstation for machine learning. I know some of you are probably saying heresy already, but we'll, we'll focus on Linux and other, other videos. For this one, we're dealing really with how am I setting up this machine to deal with Windows. And I've had previous videos where I show how I actually built this machine with the high-end Titan GTX that it has. So we're doing full GPU, all of that. Now I'm not going to take you through every single install because that would get really monotonous, but we're going to deal with the settings that I use so that, I mean, there's annoying things in Windows so that it doesn't just reboot the machine for automatic updates when you're on hour number 100 of, of a training run or something such as that, and just other some of the applications I use. So just how do I set up, for me, a Windows workstation for machine learning? To see all my videos about Kaggle, neural networks, and other AI topics, click the subscribe button and the bell next to it and select all to be notified of every new video. Okay, so let's look at how I set up a Windows 10 system. First thing that I want to get into is reboot control. This is really annoying on Windows computers, especially for machine learning, because you're setting up your computer, you're downloading Wikipedia or something that's taking forever, and it just restarts in the middle of the thing. I have been utterly, well, whatever explicit you want, by this feature of, of Windows. So Microsoft, for some reason, likes to make this fantastically complicated. So so I'll show you what I do, and I have not had a reboot unexpected in a while. This is, a, this is all around Windows updates. So if you go into Windows updates, you can change your active hours, but I don't care about it rebooting during my active hours. I want it to not reboot during my machine learning training's active hours, and that's 24-7. So that's not useful. You can also pause for up to seven days. I prefer to pause forever and then I control when it updates. So I am going to go ahead and go into the advanced options and definitely make sure that this one is off. I always turn this one off. Restart this device as soon as possible when a restart is required to install an update. If you do this, if you have this on, it will do them quite quickly and right in the middle of whatever you're doing. You still want to make sure that you're updating to install these updates. So you, I typically frequently will go to, to this page that I was just on, do this check for updates, and I'll restart. I like to control that feature. If Windows gets really annoyed with me for not updating something, it'll often put a little pop-up down here to let me know. That alone, I have not found always really prevents it from updating at the most inopportune times. So let me give you a few other things because... I don't know why Microsoft has so many different ways to prevent updates, and you seem to need to do most of them. Open up a command prompt, and I will run this as administrator. Pretty sure this works in PowerShell, too. And I'll have these in the description to the YouTube video, but this first one right here basically will do a registry update that prevents automatic rebooting. Operation completed successfully. All right. The other place that Windows likes to hide this is in the group policy. So you'll want to run the group policy editor. This isn't available on Windows Home. Don't just run it from here. That would that would just be too easy uh, because you need to run it as administrator and you can't just right click it and run as administrator again. That would be too easy. Um, so run the command prompt as administrator. Then just do gedit. Ah, that's wrong. Oh, actually, it's GP Edit. G Edit sounds like a Google product. They wouldn't call it that. 
Okay, and I don't know why this thing always gets these little um, errors. Okay, open this and go to Administrative Templates on Computer Configuration. Don't do it under User Configuration. Windows Components and then Windows Update. And again, the goal here is not for this to be easy. At least I don't think so. You have to root through here and you can't sort, you can't search. It's just painful. Here it is. No auto restart with logged in users for scheduled automatic updates. That's the needle in the haystack you're looking for. And then double click it. And I already have mine enabled because I did this on, on previous setup on this machine. But this is the guy you're looking for, no auto restart. Okay, so we can close that. Okay, so at this point, it should be it should be pretty safe. If I'm doing something really important and I just do not need this thing rebooting, I will um, pause the updates for seven days. This is probably one of my more hated features of Windows. I just wish this was easier to do. And it has messed me up so many times on losing hours and hours of work. You can't tell that I'm a little bitter just from my commentary. The other thing that I really like to do is to use Windows Insider Program. Actually, I prefer not to use Windows Insider Program. I like to really run the base versions of Windows that have been tested and vetted. However, to use some of the latest features on the Windows subsystem for Linux, I do need to enable the Windows Insider program so that I can get radioactively experimental Windows versions, uh, which, which is always fun. I like beta software. And then I can install the Windows subsystem for Linux and have access to my NVIDIA driver. So to do that, it's under Settings. And you go to the Windows Insider Program Settings. And I've already set this up. I've joined the dev channel, which is the most experimental of all of these channels, but that's what is available for me because I need the NVIDIA driver for WSL. And WSL is great. I'll get to that in just a second. So with that, I can get this latest version. And then you've got this thing down here, Windows 10 Pro Insider Preview. And this is the one that I'm, I'm currently running. So it's it was released really just a few weeks ago. And if you are running this, this is all the more reason that your computer is going to want to spontaneously reboot. So you can... Uh, Disable that like I just showed you. That gives you access to WSL, Windows Subsystem for Linux. I'm not going to actually run WSL itself, but if I do, so I've installed Ubuntu 20, and it essentially gives me a command line version of Linux running right inside of Windows. And it has access to the GPU. Now, I will warn you, if you go through, I have another video on how to install the GPU access on this. If you, when you get other updates, it tends to break that driver and you have to reinstall the driver. So, so be aware of that. My NVIDIA driver is actually in a currently broken state from, from this, but this is basically Linux. You can launch a Jupyter Notebook. And what's great about this is I can I can run this. And don't worry about that error. That's just because it doesn't detect a monitor attached. But I can basically connect to this local host. And I give it a, a password that I previously defined. It'll prompt you for that password the first time you run it. So now I can actually start up any of these environments that I've, I've designed. TensorFlow, PyTorch, whatever. And I can install the Linux versions of TensorFlow, which are always more up to date than the Windows versions. And that way I can have access to the latest version of TensorFlow using my nice browser in Windows. And Linux command line is just off here running. This is literally like having a virtual machine. And it's not like just doing the bash shell inside of Windows or something like that. So I really like this feature. This gives me... This almost feels like I'm just puttying out to another machine. And by the way, putty is what I typically use as my remote login tool for Linux machines. Putty and WinSCP are two very good tools for that that I have installed. And this is a Windows computer, so I do have the whole Microsoft Word, Excel, all these kind of things, Microsoft Office installed. I actually get that free from the university, so why not? 
LibreOffice is, is good, but sometimes I just really do need the actual Windows compatibility. I'm also a big Adobe fan, so I do pay for Adobe Education Cloud, and that gives me access to Photoshop, Adobe Illustrator, Premiere. I mean, I'm a YouTuber, I gotta use Premiere. I also use Camtasia though, primarily. Camtasia is what I'm using right now to record this. And just if you sometimes see me hit the bottom of the screen and you'll see that, oh, he's actually on a Mac. What I'm doing is just so that the screen is exactly the size that I, that I want it when I'm recording my Windows computer, I actually remote desktop into it. So I'm doing all this over, over remote desktop just because now it's formatted to the sort of 1080 screen that I want to actually display it on. Because my actual computer is one of those widescreen curved monitors that screen capture from that it's just the wrong size this is an amd based system that i built so these are some of the tools that i particularly like to check out overclocking uh, both of the gpu and of the amd chip itself the msi I won't really take you through a tutorial on each of these because there's tutorials by people who know each of these tools way better than I do, but these are the five that I, I usually install on any Windows machine that I have just so that I can look at the effects of different settings. I'm not going to demonstrate really each of these, but I, I use Microsoft Office. I use Microsoft Teams to communicate with my students. I have a Teams environment set up there. Slack and Discord are are great also and zoom i conduct my online courses in zoom with the students at the university and mctex i use that a lot now people have religious wars all over the all over on how you say latex oh my gosh latex uh latex or all these but it's it's basically how i publish my books i write them in latex latex is how i say it and then or LaTeX, I think it's the other way. Um, if there's a way to pronounce this that I have not covered and have offended anybody, be, please tell me in the comments. This is what I use for software development. Obviously, Get. All my stuff is published on GitHub. VS Code. I love VS Code. I'll probably do an entire video of how I set up VS Code. VS Code is great. It's one of my favorite Microsoft products. Love VS Code. I use it in all sorts of environments from Linux to, to Mac. I could easily do a video just on how I set it up to, to get the most effect for languages like Python. And I even edit LaTeX in here as well. It's, it's really very versatile. I like Teams as well, very much another favorite Microsoft product of me. My least favorite Microsoft products are all those various browsers that they auto-install and I, I can't delete. I use Chrome primarily as my browser. Blender is great, it's 3D modeling, some of my more advanced graphics I, I do with that. I'll, have, I'll be having videos on Blender soon enough. Uh, there's some cool things that I do that, with that. Manaconda is the Python environment that I use. Obviously, Jupyter Notebooks, Node.js uh, is useful for a lot of things, and Hexo, that's actually what I create, heatandresearch.com, and it's a static website generator. I like it because it works with Node.js. I was using, I think it was called Jekyll, and that's great, but it requires me to install this obscure language. I cannot think of the name of it right now. It's a teaching language, not Pascal. So yeah, I don't, I don't like having extra languages installed that I'm, I'm really not using. And then video and creative. I have the usual sort of tools that you would use that you'd see a lot of YouTubers use. Photoshop, InDesign, Illustrator, Premiere Pro. Camtasia is great. I don't use Premiere Pro as much as I should. I really do most of my video in Camtasia. And then FFmpeg, it's a command line utility that I use to string lots of images together and form videos. So some of the animations that you see coming out of Blender or coming out of other things that I do, those are usually stitched together with FFmpeg and then merged in with Premiere Pro or Camtasia. So that's basically it. That's how I set up a Win 10 machine when I'm using one. And I use the three major operating systems Linux, Windows, Mac, you'll, you'll see videos where I'm using really all of these. 
Mac is probably falling some from my favor just because they just don't put in NVIDIA chips on those anymore for GPUs. And that's a real problem when it comes to deep learning. Also, TensorFlow, this is not really Mac's problem, but TensorFlow just really does not get updated for the Mac as quick as Windows and Linux does. Also, Mac is going to be switching away from Intel chipset, and who even knows what that's going to look like. So Linux and Windows tend to be my two primary environments that I deal with in deep learning, and Linux especially in the cloud, because that's just the primary way to do that. Thank you for watching this video, and if you're interested in seeing more of how I use this computer, both in Windows and Linux mode, please subscribe to my YouTube channel and give this video a like. Thank you very much.